very glad to uh, to welcome everyone to this uh, lecture that is going to tackle uh, the very uh, uh, like uh, familiar to everybody, uh, but still a very uh, unexpected topic uh, from the point of view of the ancient Chinese culture that kept uh, its influence, uh, that was influencing uh, the whole Chinese uh, culture through the centuries and millennia. And uh, we'll start uh, with uh, some like general um, ideas uh, and I'll elaborate uh, them on uh, each picture. We are having like 27 or more pictures so far. Uh, and all of these are uh, from our museum collection uh, that is so far uh, not available for view for our patrons. Uh, so I'm very grateful for your invitation for the ability to spread the word about our museum and to talk about my favorite subject and I expect it to be uh, yours <laughs> too. Um, I, I think I'll be able to uh, convey a little bit of that excitement uh, and that love for nature, the ancient Chinese, the old Chinese masters uh, were like raring in their hearts and sharing with people. Uh, so uh, the, in general, the depictions of birds and animals is such a universal thing. Uh, that we can hardly like uh, separate it from like the whole development of uh, human cultures. Uh, but I have to point out that the uh, cults of sacred birds, the birds protectors, the birds patrons of human beings, uh, where uh, those cults were very popular in southern China in like. Um, second millennia uh, be, uh, before common era. And uh, well, hopefully one day we'll travel to Chengdu uh, to their museum to see the separate exhibition on that. And uh, the birds are mentioned in ancient classics from Shi Jing, from the uh, Book of Odes uh, to say uh, the creations of um, uh, 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 Zhou, uh, dynasty, uh, like the famous, uh, say, uh, Zhongzi. Uh, there are lots of mentioning, uh, uh, lots of parables uh, where there are wild nature is mentioned. Uh, the birds, uh, the trees, uh, they're given some human traits. Uh, they are uh, percepted as uh, those um, equally to human. Um, uh, and uh, so uh, that's that's what was the like the first point of my uh, lecture, and and we'll see that we'll mention all that uh, throughout the lecture, and uh, then we'll skip to the like seventh uh, century uh, common era, uh, when the genre of painting birds and flowers and depicting uh, all uh, natural, uh, all, all wild nature and also uh, the uh, pets and uh, all kinds of uh, domestic animals. Uh, it really flourished and it was uh, tightly related to the life of literati who were proficient in both poetry and calligraphy and painting and who interacted with uh, nature. They were creating their private parks for, for the first time in this time. Uh, in this uh, in the, during the times of those dynasty. Yeah. And then there was uh, a spread of Buddhism and there was a need to uh, depict the flowers, uh, the sacred uh, gardens of uh, the heaven of Buddha Amida where the um, most uh, like, uh, where the most devoted Buddhists uh, go after death to uh, finish their uh, circle of um, passions and uh, sufferings in this world of life. And then in, uh, and that was in uh, like also Tang uh, dynasty, which, which was from seventh to 10th century. 
uh, and uh, the tradition of uh, uh, decorating, adorning uh, religious painting and painting the uh, scenes of imaginary heaven uh, was closely related to the depiction of flowers. Uh, then there was Taoist quest for good omens. Uh, the nature was a powerful source of inspiration for all Taoist practices. And uh, after that, we'll talk about uh, the depictions of natural habitat that becomes more like a cliche, uh, but still we'll, have, we'll try to distinguish if those uh, birds and flowers are real or are those fantasies. And if there are uh, so many observations of nature, if there are so many uh, instances when people observe uh, nature for its own sake, just for pleasure, uh, of uh, an idealized world where everything is idealized, both humans and uh, living nature and even stones and like. And so where are the rules, uh, how to create uh, the ideal environment, the best, uh, uh, like how, the best breed of some animals, how to show it, how to convey uh, the uh, ultimate, uh, <laughs> the best of uh, all nature uh, to the audience. And uh, like uh, when we talk about human perception, we'll also, we'll also talk about the humans, uh, the personas uh, whose lives were uh, tied to, the, to some flowers who became like, a, spirits of flowers, the gods of flowers, and um, it was separated from uh, the whole perception of nature uh, in China. Uh, we'll also see how the elitist art influenced work, uh, folk art and how folk art uh, borrowed some ideas from religious and um, uh, religious art and art of nobility. And uh, eventually we'll come up to the modern uh, approach to the bird and flower genre. And we also will also see if the birds and flowers are only, <laughs> were the, they are the only subjects of uh, this genre. So uh, I'll, um, I would suggest to start and, and fo uh, like follow the blooming trees, uh, the plants bringing fruits, uh, this natural cycle uh, uh, that is percepted uh, such in, uh, in China that uh, some months are like the month of blooming plum, then there is a month of um, chrysanthemum and like. So the whole uh, year is uh, like adorned with flowers and for sure with other animals that are often mentioned during these seasons. So as I've mentioned before, uh, the paintings were created by those who didn't have to observe nature for like just uh, primary basic uh, needs for having shelter, for tending uh, cattle or like. Uh, so uh, the aesthetics came first, uh, but still um, there were so many uh, expectations. Uh, to say, uh, like people were observing nature uh, for its own sake, but still with some ideas that uh, this can bring some uh, spirits of nature, uh, some energies from observing, from just observing nature, but it may inspire, it may bring uh, good luck, good health, uh, just because of seeing a kind of a, a bird or a flower, a blooming, a blooming flower, a bird coming from, a, from afar. 
So we start with Chunzi uh, with the new year uh, on the Chinese calendar that uh, usually starts in February, uh, according to our common uh, calendar. And uh, the plum tree or Meihua, uh, uh, as we can see here, uh, it blooms among snow and it's a good omen. It's a first uh, sign of the coming spring. And uh, what I have to mention here also, that we have uh, daffodils and the daffodils stand for the last uh, month of the previous year. Uh, so this way, uh, when uh, the, uh, these two uh, kinds of uh, flowers are combined in one, in one painting, uh, in one composition, it means that there is uh, some uh, direct uh, passage from the previous achievements, uh, previous wealth and growth. Uh, and with, uh, it, it is like um, going to be a relay uh, for the next year with the blooming uh, plum. And uh, the way the plum is depicted is uh, like, uh, has very strict rules so far. Uh, and these rules were applied also for the uh, real trees uh, growing in a garden of San Literati. So uh, the trees would expect to have uh, sturdy branches, uh, um, like a a big sturdy trunk, and the branches are uh, spreading in all directions. They are they should also go up. Uh, that's that's like a principal rule that they are uh, up like somehow uplifts you <laughs> together when when you look at them, and the uh, flowers themselves should be turned as you can see here and uh, say here at this place. So we, we see that there are lots of uh, flowers, but they are turned in all directions to us uh, in the opposite direction. Um, so almost like say people that are turning faces in all directions. And that's uh, uh, the role of like looking at a real tree expecting uh, to see uh, that um, very three-dimensional picture of uh, all, all small flowers creating the whole look, and then also conveying that in a painting. And when we, uh, when we are almost done with the uh, plum, I, um, well, I have to mention also that um, this um, beauty of uh, um, of the uh, small petals uh, of the blossoms, uh, it is often uh, underlined that this is uh, underlined that uh, this is not the only trait of this uh, tree. It is sturdy. It is uh, very resilient. It is very um, uh, like uh, it, it stands uh, among all, uh, all that harsh weather of uh, changing seasons. Uh, so uh, the combination, uh, not a contradiction of fragility and sturdiness is uh, always emphasized when uh, people depict uh, plum blossom or they may uh, like praise uh, plum blossom in uh, poetry. So the double meaning, uh, the beauty and st uh, sturdiness uh, is always emphasized when, it, when we talk about plum tree. And uh, plum tree is uh, Meihua and Mei uh, are eyebrows actually. In Chinese, the different character, but it sounds similar to Mei. And uh, there was um, a formula, a well-wishing formula, like uh, to have uh, happiness straight before your eyes, on your eyebrows. So uh, the uh, magpie sitting on a uh, blooming blossom, uh, uh, on the uh, blooming tree is like C, C, C. So you see the, the character C for happiness. Uh, 
And so the happiness came, see, <laughs> see uh, the magpie, came uh, to uh, uh, Meihua, the, uh, the plum blossom, that is like the, it came directly into, uh, uh, before your eyes. So you, you see the happiness, the embodiment of happiness here. Uh, so that's uh, how the new year starts with new expectations, with expectations of both beauty and resilience and um, sturdiness and strength. And uh, when uh, plum blossom is mentioned, it's also uh, like, we'll just uh, skip one slide and go back to it. Uh, it is always, uh, it, not always, but often at the plum blossom, the plum tree is mentioned uh, along with bamboo and pine tree. And uh, these, um, Three, they are considered uh, like the three friends. They are uh, um, like uh, the symbol of people. The three friends who are uh, withstanding hardships uh, altogether. So they are uh, green and blooming, uh, the, the green pine tree, the green bamboo and the blooming plant. Uh, they are showing their beauty uh, in harsh weather. Uh, so this is the way um, they are like presenting their strength against hardships and uh, they, are, they stand for, for people, for friends who uh, stay together uh, during some trying times. Uh, so uh, this uh, like coinage, this uh, phrase, uh, um, it is mentioned uh, in poetry from starting from uh, uh, 12th century from Sudanpur uh, to other uh, artists and po um, poets uh, who praised those three, uh, like the symbol of uh, resilience and uh, nobility and beauty uh, against all odds. And uh, the bamboo uh, itself, it became quite a cliche, but a positive cliche, very um, important uh, depiction uh, subject uh, in the Chinese art, uh, starting with, um, uh, with the cousin of Sudunpo, I've mentioned him from the 12th century, uh, uh, the uh, Song Dynasty. Uh, so um, there was uh, a, a painter, uh, Wen Tung, uh, who was uh, this much elder cousin of Sudan Po, and he was painting uh, bamboo. He was very excited, uh, very keen on just depicting bamboo. And uh, his pictures were so lifelike that everyone was uh, so mesmerized and people like were wondering, how do you, how do you capture this, the spirit, the essence of bamboo? Uh, so um, the person who eventually dared to ask such a question was Lung Po. And according to his, uh, his um, notes, uh, his cousin replied like, uh, I just uh, I'm just looking at it uh, in uh, under every kind of conditions like under moonlight and in snow and uh, in uh, sunshine. I observe it and I have um, a kind of an image of bamboo in my heart. Uh, so uh, when I start painting, I'm painting from my heart already. Uh, so uh, I, I don't have to see the um, like some some details. I have the whole picture, and this uh, quote, Xiongyu uh, uh, Changzhu. Uh, so the, like there is um, a full image of bamboo in one's heart, one was chest, chest uh, became uh, an idiom uh, for like a well thought of plan. Uh, the ready-made plan that is like for sure the the plan that will uh, lead you to success 100%. Uh, but still, uh, these uh, quotes, this fascination with bamboo, and this um, great respect for the previous generations of artists led uh, the subject of bamboo to such a 
prominent role, like everybody had to copy it. Uh, so sometimes uh, this motive is quite uh, to perhaps too much used, uh, but still uh, it, it's very important for the whole Chinese uh, history of ours and the history of describing the very process of creativity. And uh, now, uh, before we go to uh, to the other, the third of the friends, to before we go to uh, the pine tree, we'll go back to uh, spring blossoming. And uh, here are the two other, you know, like the combination of willow trees and plum blossom that indicates spring, spring at its utmost. Uh, the, um, the highest joy of spring, uh, but also uh, the, uh, when we sometimes break the rules, uh, it may uh, appear that uh, there is a gentle hint, uh, a gentle suggestion uh, that this uh, beautiful picture that uh, extols uh, the beauties, uh, the, the joys of spring is still uh, key, it, it still keeps some uh, mockery, uh, some uh, like um, gentle suggestions that not everything is okay. Uh, so here we have uh, the willow tree. Uh, the willows were so much prized uh, by the, all the Chinese literature through, throughout its like uh, history. Uh, from the very beginning, from the Book of Odes, uh, when the uh, the canopies of uh, hanging uh, willow branches, uh, they are like a welcoming place uh, for every human. Uh, so the uh, willow became uh, the uh, symbol of hospitality, of like a pleasant environment. And uh, the uh, also it, uh, symbolized the joys of spring. Uh, and also in uh, Tang uh, Dynasty poetry, um, it was uh, compared to the feminine beauty. And uh, poets uh, as, uh, uh, well, perhaps every poet, <laughs> or, or, or every prominent poet of uh, Tang uh, Dynasty, uh, wrote uh, a poem about uh, Willow, uh, but Baudry uh, was perhaps the first who uh, straightforwardly compared uh, willow trees sleeping among willows. Uh, uh, he compared it to uh, going to some amusement uh, quarters, uh, going to courtesans. Um, so more and more that became uh, the the willow tree mentioning of willow tree became uh, like a hint to a brother. So when we have uh, that mentioning of uh, like uh, um, uh, these activities, uh, so this this becomes like a spirit of an evil. Um, there were also some superstitions that there were some spirits living in it in this tree. So uh, the willow trees were somehow pushed back, uh, um, and even in the landscapes, uh, there were willows uh, around lakes. Uh, around uh, along the riverbanks, but the willows were not planted in uh, within the premises where people may live, and uh, that was not the case in uh, the uh, fifth uh, century uh, common era when uh, the famous poet and downshifter uh, Tao Yuanming uh, um, enjoyed uh, his rest, his downshifting in his um, ancestry. Uh, house, and it was said that he, his house was surrounded by five five willows. By that time, it was all okay to have willows in one in one's house around one's house. Uh, but like two or three centuries later, it, uh, the, this uh, um, symbol became like more controversial. Uh, so when we see this uh, picture of hanging willow branches and some uh, plum blossom, 
So we see that this is spring, but also we see those uh, funny birds. Uh, they are like uh, relatives to our Europe European thrushes and um, blackbirds. Uh, and uh, in uh, Chinese, they are jabago, and they are often kept in uh, cages uh, because uh, they are funny. Uh, they learn uh, to repeat their human voices, uh, and well, the the bird itself is um, understood among all strata, all uh, whatever could be those. Uh, peasants or uh, intellectuals, uh, everyone understands this bird as something funny, like uh, in our European law, it's more like about a parrot. Uh, we like we think of parrots like of some uh, <laughs> a bit stupid birds that are just able to repeat the human voice and that's it. Um, so uh, the birds that are kept for fun uh, and the birds uh, that are not very big, uh, the birds whose um, feathers are grayish, blackish, um, they are not very like presentable, <laughs> they're just funny. And you see that these are fighting here, these are just sitting. Uh, so, um, I'm sorry, uh, this picture suggests that these are people of, uh, uh, not the best descent, not the best behavior. Um, they are quarreling, they are spending time in uh, some uh, with some courtesans. So, overall, this picture is not about uh, spring and the vividness of nature in spring, but uh, rather um, it's a metaphor for people <laughs> whose behavior could be much better. Uh, so, um, I don't really know. Uh, what uh, was uh, like when the uh, picture uh, arrived uh, at the collection of uh, Tasia and uh, Andres Stefan Jaspar uh, in mid uh, 20th century? I've, uh, I've told you about the history of our collection last time. So I really wonder if uh, the French and the Russian uh, uh, people like. Uh, Madame Monsieur Jaspar where did they get that hint? Did they understand the metaphor behind the picture or they just uh, collected the painting of birds and flowers? Uh, so the, <laughs> this question is still open and I, I, I'm not going to assume anything on their part. Uh, so we've talked about bamboo and we see this um, colors on uh, silk here. And uh, the, this picture was a copy of famous artists of Song Dynasty. And still we have a different approach, um, like just the impression of bamboo leaves, the uh, impression of uh, shadows, the bamboo leaf, uh, leaves uh, have uh, on some perhaps curtains and there is just a moon circle behind it. Uh, so this uh, picture was presented to Madame and Monsieur Jaspar by the author, uh, as it, uh, the inscription suggests. Uh, so this is <laughs> almost modern, uh, but you see the, tra the tradition continues. And eventually we came up to the third friend of those uh, three friends who withstand um, cold weather and hardships of winter. And this is uh, uh, the pine tree. And the pine tree is where uh, the, uh, the subject of real adoration among literati, the, the distant uh, mountain with the solitary pine somewhere on its top was such a favorite topic to, to prize in poetry, to depict in, in paintings. Uh, but still, the uh, Pines were also introduced to, uh, say, Buddhist uh, monasteries and convents, to Taoist convents and monasteries. And uh, these uh, pines were also kept in small uh, bonsai pots. Bonsai, we can borrow this word from the, the Japanese language, but still, uh, 
the the word is um, the coinage uh, initially was uh, the Chinese, uh, like in the landscape in a pot. So the uh, small uh, trees uh, grown in the way that they don't die of uh, like uh, very scarce uh, nutrients and ability to grow, but still they, they grow very small. Uh, they were the uh, the pine, pine trees were perfect for creating bonsai. And uh, this also became like part of uh, both landscape painting and birds and flowers painting. And uh, we, we cannot imagine Chinese uh, art without depictions of uh, pine tree uh, that is also uh, that also stands for uh, longevity, uh, for a long life and the if if we if would see a, a deer and a crane here, that would be an absolutely like a longevity wish. And uh, also uh, going back to bamboo a little bit, uh, also it's uh, so, uh, like a symbol of a person uh, who is noble and who can withstand hardships as uh, the very uh, trunk, the stem of bamboo uh, is uh, able to like to bend during the storm and then bounce back. So the, sum, uh, the um, symbol of resilience, uh, the bamboo and the symbol of longevity and also with withstanding hardships, the pine tree. And uh, well, after all hardships, we are back to something like more colorful, uh, more vivid, uh, the blooming uh, wisteria. Uh, and uh, the bird here, uh, I don't have uh, the proper name for it in Chinese. It's not even a Chinese bird. It, uh, it is common for regions like Indonesia and Philippines. Uh, so it was introduced to China mostly. And when my colleague uh, uh, like was just working on the decorative arts collection now museum, uh, she just contacted uh, our friend, the ornithologist, and um, uh, she was just wondering if this bird was like a, a real one or was, was it just a fantasy? So it appeared to be the real um, but, uh, biological species. Um, and while uh, there were no these birds in China, like <laughs> in the times of, uh, uh, say, uh, Tang Dynasty in, uh, in the seventh to 10th century, uh, but there were lots of wisterias. And wisterias uh, became a sign, uh, like a symbol of uh, personality uh, that is very uh, attractive at the first sight. Uh, but then uh, this person or this plant uh, still has some poison in it and still has some abilities to um, uh, like uh, grab the person's attention and not to leave. Uh, so uh, in my uh, like in, uh, in my reading of that, that would be like um, a metaphor of some narcissist uh, relationship. Uh, but this time, this is wisteria, and uh, Zhao Bozui uh, was uh, was sorry, not not, not Zhao Bozui, uh, but uh, Bozui. I'm sorry, Bozui, uh, the poet, um, was uh, known for uh, bringing up uh, the uh, uh, the symbolism of uh, this wisteria flowers uh, as. A, uh, beautiful outside, but cunning inside personality. Uh, so we move uh, to some more blossoms uh, of spring and almost summer. And here we are, the uh, peonies. Uh, it is easier like to tell uh, what um, uh, positive traits it does not symbolize because um, Although uh, I've mentioned that the, this means uh, the, the depiction of peony uh, means wealth and career advances, uh, still is uh, also the symbol of feminine beauty. It's a symbol of uh, uh, the 
uh, all pros the prosperity and uh, all kinds of wealth. So uh, besides this uh, common name, almost a scientific name, Modern, Modern Hua, uh, I put uh, the poetic name, uh, the name of uh, like uh, the comparison, the uh, the flow of um, wealth and uh, treasures. And um, there are lots of legends, perhaps uh, some of you have already heard that legend of uh, um, the Empress Wu Zetian of uh, Tang, uh, Tang Dynasty, uh, who was known for like cruel, evil uh, uh, way of uh, ruling the country, but perhaps uh, the only cruelty uh, we can mention, like she, she was, uh, it, it was all okay for male, uh, emperors to behave that way and it was considered immoral uh, for the empress to do the same thing. Uh, so uh, this quite a misogynic um, approach uh, was the source of the legend that once uh, Wu Zetian, who, who was also kind of a sorceress, uh, a witch, uh, she made every uh, flower bloom at once and the, those were only uh, peony uh, blossoms who, pe pe peony bushes who uh, didn't agree to that like human or magical uh, um, uh, rule. Uh, they, they didn't agree to, to obey it, so they were punished by, by like burning them, but still they revived. Uh, so uh, uh, behind, uh, besides uh, these stories, um, uh, there are just uh, like uh, excitement about the peonies and uh, uh, ex exactly during the times that we are told that uh, evil Wu Zetian was uh, uh, so harsh and so authoritarian on all flowers. Uh, those times were when the uh, all sorts of uh, uh, Peonies were uh, introduced like the uh, flowers for gardens, for intellectuals and uh, the, the highest elite to enjoy the blooming. Uh, so, so far uh, it was just like the development of, of very strange and very exuberant uh, uh, flower breeds and uh, what can match these opulence of uh, blooming peonies is the depiction of a pheasant. Uh, and the bird is considered like um, the big bird, the bright bird is considered to be uh, like a person who is outstanding with uh, uh, like facial features with the uh, um, in, uh, inherited the wealth and uh, status, and also with the knowledge and uh, high virtue. Uh, so the mm, there were no like specific uh, book, specific poetry, uh, or like to uh, be the source of all those comparisons. But still, over the history of the Chinese uh, culture it became like almost obvious for this culture, like the smaller birds, the darker birds are the symbols of uh, some more people, like people not very intelligent, not very industrious, not very uh, of high virtue and like and like. And on the opposite, the bigger the bird, the brighter the bird is, uh, then it is uh, like an embodiment of, um, person who is virtuous, clever, uh, uh, noble, and like. Uh, so the depiction of uh, such a bird with uh, among these flowers is obviously a good sign, a good wish, a wish of a spacious life. And also uh, talking about the bird, uh, the, uh, the, uh, actually the roosters and the peacocks and uh, all those big birds, uh, that have some kind of uh, like crests on their heads and who have big claws. Uh, they were considered like those um, 
people, mostly male, uh, who would combine the virtues and talents of both military leaders and the uh, uh, literati. So the literati were supposed to be uh, good at exams to uh, and, uh, enter the high positions at the court uh, or in some uh, provinces uh, to be the bureaucrats of the huge empire. Uh, so the plumage on the top of the head was supposed to be like a uh, headdress and the um, he headgear of higher officials. And uh, the claws, uh, the big uh, feet, were supposed to be like those, the spurs of infantrymen. Uh, so that suggested the military activity. So uh, an ideal human male was, uh, should be both proficient in literature and sciences, both in literature and sciences and in military activities. Should be brave, uh, physically fit, and uh, quite smart in strategies. So uh, these birds were like embodiment of those idealized male persons, combining both like peaceful uh, talents and the uh, virtues of a military leader. And we have some uh, other depictions of um, peonies uh, in our collections. And perhaps uh, the picture on the left is more clear. Um, uh, but on this, at the same time, it's uh, like uh, more of a craftsman production. And unfortunately, the uh, picture of the uh, painting on the right doesn't uh, give justice to the original that uh, belong, used to belong to the museum founders. And uh, those hues of those petals and the vividness of those leaves, how they turn, how they are really like spreading on all dimensions. Mm, uh, this is my, uh, such a uh, masterful uh, depiction of nature. Like uh, we can hardly see this in, in, in this foliage and these uh, mm, uh, blossoms that are like more like flat. Uh, but still, uh, as you can see, the different uh, artists, the different abilities, uh, the different like talents, uh, but still we have almost the same, com same composition, the same layout, like the big rocks here, the big rocks here, and there is a bush of peonies growing on it or from behind it, and some also some smaller uh, uh, vegetation, some smaller flowers down there. Uh, so uh, the introduction of all those uh, stones, although I'm going to elaborate on birds and flowers and all fauna and, uh, and uh, fauna, uh, uh, flora, but still, uh, when we talk about uh, human interaction with nature, and those intellectuals and uh, emperors and all kinds of rulers who uh, tended their gardens, no matter bigger or smaller they were. Uh, we have to mention the landscapes, overall landscapes, and those landscapes are inevitably, uh, they need huge or smaller, but slabs of stone, and they need some water beds, smaller ponds or big lakes, uh, being uh, like dug out and uh, widened by humans uh, or some natural small uh, water beds. Uh, still, uh, these, uh, uh, the, these uh, ideas of combining like mountains and uh, waters uh, on bigger, smaller scale, it was very uh, like, inseparable from the story of the, uh, the history of the Chinese uh, literary aesthetics. And uh, those uh, uh, big uh, slabs of stone, uh, they were uh, actually firstly in introduced to Buddhist, uh, uh, Buddhist uh, convents and uh, monasteries. 
and they were part of uh, the uh, like but just preaching uh, the stories of uh, contemplating uh, simple things like just stones, uh, but still uh, literati and uh, emperors and uh, princes, they all wanted uh, not just stones, but like some more embellishment to their gardens so they couldn't help, but they planted uh, all those peonies and other uh, uh, other plants and other flowers along with the uh, uh, around those uh, necessary uh, big slabs of stone. So here we have a very different technique, but also this is a peony and it's also on a rock and there is uh, such a the big the big slab of stone, the big slab of rock of the rock and you see the tiny uh, black and white as uh, the whole picture is black and white flowers of orchids and uh, combining uh, the um, opulent the big and bright uh, flowers of peony with small but fragrant uh, flowers of uh, an orchid uh, was also a hint of like uh, having uh, both uh, like vivid social life uh, high recognition of one's talents but still like uh, keeping uh, everything like modest and um, uh, perhaps nurturing oneself from inside, uh, upgrading oneself. And the depiction of uh, an orchid stands for it so much. Like when we see this female garment and it's also like everywhere it's embroidered with orchids here. So it was like a hint uh, for having, uh, like a wish for having uh, lots of talents, a high virtue, but still being modest about that. Like the very small, or always small uh, flower of an orchid. And uh, still, um, uh, well, uh, while uh, the Chinese were so, um, efficient, uh, so, so really cool in um, breeding uh, peonies, uh, like all, all kinds of breeds. Uh, they were uh, looking for orchids. Uh, they, they were actually growing orchids indoors in smaller ports, uh, but they were not uh, much introducing, like they were not much um, uh, making some changes in like genetics of orchids. They were, they were preferring to get uh, wild orchids from somewhere in the mountains. And it was said that some intellectuals, some wealthy people uh, could buy the whole boat of orchids uh, brought by peasants from faraway mountains and to uh, sort through the whole boat of orchids collected to find some rare species and then um, just to just to give him back all the other orchids to the uh, boat's owner to for, for the future resale. Uh, so uh, there were not uh, like uh, not much uh, of those uh, different uh, breeds of orchids. Uh, not, uh, not much of that human uh, influence to orchids that was depicted in uh, the in painting in embroidery so the embroidered uh, uh, orchids are always like the same and i <laughs> also think uh, you enjoyed a lot the master class of uh, orchid painting with chi Ting yesterday so perhaps she told you <laughs> even more on the subject uh, uh, much more than uh, i'm able to tell you now and now we move to the summer, to the very, the very epitome of summer, which is lotus. And uh, the uh, symbolism of lotus is already mentioned in the Book of Odes in Shizin. Uh, it was uh, like um, the center of the world and the uh, fishes uh, revolving, playing around the um, you know, the big stem of a lotus 
were considered like the all the humans and uh, element uh, and um, like animals and, and nature elements that revolve around. I'm sorry, uh, that revolve around the center of the world, with some kind of uh, focus on the source of everything. Uh, but then, uh, with the spread of Buddhism, uh, this uh, flower became uh, like it, it, it has already existed. Uh, it was part of a diet because almost every part of it was also used for some uh, household purposes or for food. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the flower became the adornment of um, uh, icons. Uh, in uh, Buddhism, uh, the uh, fresh flowers were put in uh, were put in altars, and uh, the overall the, uh, uh, the such a magnificent bloom and such a, a useful <laughs> a flower was uh, like uh, it it inevitably became such a good symbol for all like all. Um, uh, all I, all, everything in life, uh, like it's a purity because it grows in uh, muddy water, but it, it opens uh, as a fragrant flower. It's uh, useful for uh, whatever, like uh, treating colds and like, and it's tasty. And, uh, and even the leaves are used to wrap uh, things like the, the very ecological way, <laughs> like uh, the, the, na the natural bags. And uh, what we can uh, also see in this uh, painting is the fly-like insect, the cicada and uh, Jin Chan. And um, uh, this creature is also very important for the uh, Chinese poetry, uh, for the history of culture as uh, the excavations from Zhou dynasty uh, show the uh, small jade cicadas uh, put into the mouth of a deceased to, uh, with the belief that uh, uh, this symbol will help them uh, uh, like uh, uh, re, uh, re being reborn in the future life. So this is a symbol of rebirth, uh, the symbol of longevity. And uh, here, uh, like among the lotuses, so uh, altogether we can see that is already the wish for uh, abundance, for purity, for uh, longevity, and also these two ducks, a couple of ducks, uh, is supposed to be a harmonious couple. And uh, mandarino ducks were just uh, simple ducks. Uh, uh, they were always the uh, symbols of uh, happy, harmonious marriage. Uh, so the whole picture you see is very full. It's full of the best wishes for everything one like you can uh, wish for uh, in life, like from some high moral virtues to harmony uh, in uh, family life to longevity. And uh, if we look at this picture, we can uh, overall, we can say, well, this is a very uh, um, like uh, a typical uh, painting of uh, in, uh, in the style of uh, Gung Bi, the meticulous brush, uh, the uh, very uh, like uh, vein on, on the sleeve, uh, all, all the petals are uh, given like structure, uh, like there are uh, feathers and ducks, uh, and even, uh, well, uh, I wish I could show you one day uh, the, uh, the big, uh, as you can see, it's a meter and a half uh, in length. Uh, this picture, this is this painting. So you will see the cicada is also painted very meticulously. Uh, and these, uh, this style, uh, it uh, derives from the court painting. Uh, so the first, um, actually, 
the first paintings uh, were not, not for uh, just enjoyment of the author, but they were ordered by emperors, princes, uh, and only in like uh, 16th century, uh, the wealthy merchants became the primary uh, customers of painters. Uh, so uh, the painter was often uh, like forced to uh, paint in a way that would be recognizable, understandable right away. And uh, we'll talk about the opposite later. And now we'll see the embroidered lotus. And, and it's also very kind of realistic. We cannot call it the modern day realism, the European art realism, uh, but still we can recognize the flowers and the leaves uh, and it grows from the pot and the um, servants of this Buddhist uh, almost saint, like the, the disciple of Buddha Shakyamuni, uh, the 16th Sarhat, uh, these people, they are attending for the, uh, their lotus and they are attending for incense. Uh, I'm not touching the subject of incense here, but uh, still the fragrant lotus, uh, the incense here, um, so we have uh, lots of uh, symbols of uh, purity, of cleanness, of spiritual cleanness and refinement. Uh, and you can see the finest work with a needle that can be compared uh, to that of a meticulous brush. And now we have a very different uh, picture uh, that we can like, even ponder for a second if this is also a lotus, as we read from the description, uh, from, the, from the title. But yes, this is still uh, the uh, very different approach to painting. The painting for refining oneself, for self-improvement, uh, the meditative process, and the uh, uh, Painting that would be uh, recognized recognized as that of a high value, but by not not by some customer, but by the closest circle of friends and the same-minded people, like-minded people. Uh, so these are different approaches to the same subject uh, throughout the history and the uh, actually these uh, the CAE the free hand. Uh, the brisk and powerful way of painting uh, was exist, uh, has been existing in the Chinese art since like uh, 11th and 12th century, uh, but it uh, was based also on the uh, Buddhist and Zen Buddhist and Taoist uh, practices and mindset. So there is so much to talk about. Uh, if we have time uh, later on, I can elaborate more on that. On that. But we still have some uh, creatures that are very, very filled in, with, filled with some meanings behind the depictions. Uh, so here, uh, like uh, uh, this picture is uh, mostly like a dec decorative, decorative uh, showing any fruit, any. Uh, like a big uh, uh, flower would in general be like a good wish. And when we see those peaches, we all will always think of uh, Siwang Mu, of the uh, mother of the West, the goddess who uh, has a special garden where those peaches grow for 3000 years. And the, any mortal that may taste those peaches uh, bec becomes immortal. And so there is a long history of uh, those legends uh, mentioned by Ge Hung in the third uh, century uh, common era. Uh, and later on, like the idea of peaches, uh, the, the fruits of longevity of eternal life. Uh, so the whole picture is um, like filled with those peaches here and there and the uh, poppy flowers 
they stand, uh, ironically, they stand for the last year, uh, last uh, month of the year, as well as uh, the daffodils. Uh, but here they are combined in one picture. So perhaps that was also a kind of a hint for the uh, future owner of the picture. And uh, about the bird, uh, sorry, so far I am not, uh, aware of the species. So <laughs> our collaboration with the biologist is going to uh, continue. And the, um, also uh, the medlar here, the, the, uh, the fruits here, uh, the odra, uh, they stand for like, oh, like sweetness and fruits. Uh, so it's obvious that this is a good wish. Again, more fruits here. So the persimmon, shizu. So uh, in um, well-wishing compositions, we often see uh, like some pyramids uh, of, fru of orange fruits. Uh, could those be tangerines, oranges, or persimmon? And uh, they often stand for like, uh, like offerings for uh, some gods, uh, deities. Uh, or they can just uh, create a nice uh, still life, although we don't uh, like actually have such a, such a genre uh, in Chinese art, like still life. <laughs> the, the life shouldn't be still in Chinese art. Uh, so the uh, uh, bittersweet persimmon, uh, the uh, tart persimmon, um, it also stands for uh, like shiny, uh, species uh, like uh, like for, for shiny treasures or for species happenings because sh is of uh, is also uh, sound like sh like shooting uh, like uh, some event so for sure that would be like uh, a happy event or if it is combined with uh, the um, with some like wand uh, the rui. Uh, thing so that would be the wish for like 10,000 things to be according to your wish and here we have a white parrot here uh, and the, uh, the symbolism of a parrot is different from the um, our modern European understanding although we have uh, earlier samples like uh, parrots could be even uh, symbols of uh, Virgin Mary and like in the earlier Christian tradition, but now we consider the parrots as something just funny. Uh, but in the Chinese art, uh, this symbolism derives from the Indian uh, folklore and derives from the uh, stories of um, previous rebirth of Buddha Shakyamuni. And uh, this way it is uh, connected to the idea that uh, the ability to uh, copy human speech is uh, a sign of a straightforwardness, a sign of uh, telling the truth. And there were Jatakas, the stories of Buddha's rebirth uh, that mention uh, him being uh, a parrot who, uh, was, uh, who, who stayed in uh, his nest uh, against all odds, against uh, the um, some uh, harsh weather that destroyed the tree, almost destroyed the tree uh, the nest was built on. Uh, but still the uh, bird was loyal, was very attached to the place of his living, of his birth. So uh, the um, bird became an embodiment of wisdom, uh, telling the truth and loyalty. And uh, you've mentioned that, uh, you, you've, uh, you may have mentioned that uh, this, noticed that um, this bird is white. And the excitement about the white birds, white animals, um, and expectations that any such a rare animal will bring good luck to the court, to the whole country, uh, was one of the focuses of uh, Jodzi, uh, the um, uh, Emperor Huizong, uh, who lived in, who ruled in early 12th, uh, 12th century, and uh, who was a better 
a much, much a better artist uh, than he was a ruler, he was an emperor, uh, because he was really obsessed with the uh, symbolism of everything. Uh, he was, he has lost, he had lost uh, 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 connection with the real things and eventually he lost his uh, half of his kingdom. Um, but uh, his uh, talent and his interest in nature was uh, really respected throughout the uh, Chinese history and history of us. And um, uh, the many, the numerous uh, pictures from his collection, he was a painter himself and he also encouraged lots of his um, a nobleman to follow his hobby, uh, to follow his uh, addiction uh, in painting and in creating gardens and uh, making uh, like uh, beautiful things for the, th uh, for the sake of uh, harmonizing the whole world, as he be believed. Uh, this quest for beauty and, uh, and some spiritual values was highly recognized and those um, numerous pictures were uh, eventually copied and became like also some kinds of um, almost cliches, almost uh, um, sacred examples of painting uh, that should be repeated. Uh, so uh, this uh, by you, in, in, in fact, uh, the, picture, the depicted uh, bird is not a kite, uh, but the name for it stands, uh, it's, it's a historical name for this kind of depiction. Uh, so uh, it was a copy of a copy of a copy perhaps uh, from the Emperor Palace uh, that ended up in our museum. So the popularity of all those uh, good omens and uh, extraordinary animals uh, was uh, kept in the century, during the centuries uh, all against the fact that the author of those paintings was not a very good ruler, who almost uh, well, um, led to the whole China to um, like some hardships, long, long time hardships. Uh, so uh, this uh, idea of albino uh, animals uh, as good almonds it continues here with a white swallow, an albino swallow. You can see like it has no pigments at all. The, the, red, the red beak and almost red eyes, all safe for, for, for the real albino animal. And uh, this combination of uh, pear blossom and, and two swallows, in, in, Originally, there were two swallows, and our uh, album has um, such a rare depiction of, of one swallow, but still it's an auspicious, uh, uh, absolutely positive, like heavenly swallow. Uh, the, the very uh, first depiction of the combination of these two uh, was in the uh, 15th century. Uh, so again, uh, the composition state almost the same and the artists were just playing like um, uh, like adding some details to it but the, the combining of those swallows or swallow and uh, pear blossom uh, for good almond of spring uh, it it was uh, it had had it, had its continuity through the centuries and uh, then we go to uh, like uh, talking talking about extraordinary things uh, like rare, uh, uh, rare white animals, uh, we uh, we uh, go to the subject of gourds of calabash, and these uh, like regular things uh, they're very common uh, available to every household because those. Uh, but bottle gourds, they can grow in any garden and they really don't need the, some quest in mountains like the orchids or uh, some special breeze like a peony could, uh, could be. Um, uh, but uh, they are like 
really available. They are everywhere. But still, the shape of this gourd is uh, very familiar for, um, to everyone who has ever looked at the uh, depictions of uh, Taoist uh, deities, uh, like uh, Taguali, to say, um, the immortal, uh, one of uh, eight uh, Taoist immortals who, who was said to uh, be so uh, so long of uh, the banquets with uh, the banquet with deities that he had lost his body and had to uh, live in a body of a, a drifter who died by the road and he, he had to live uh, in this new body in the other person's body. Uh, the, um, the Magu uh, fairy, the, the Magu, uh, the, the goddess Magu, uh, uh, often uh, lo lots of other deities, they are depicted with uh, such a bottle made of uh, uh, regular gourd, regular calabash. Uh, they, uh, it is supposed that every such calabash contains uh, the, uh, the elixir of life, uh, the elixir that gives immortality, uh, eternal health and wealth and whatever you can, you can wish. Uh, so the depiction of these uh, goods, uh, it, it is insuper inseparable uh, from the uh, depictions of deities, uh, but still uh, just for, for itself, for like the um, birds and flowers painting, you can see uh, the late 19th century, uh, new approaches to uh, combining the uh, the color color painting and uh, the brisk uh, depictions of uh, CE of freehand painting style, yeah, and you can uh, see the contrast with this shiny uh, three dimensional gourd uh, that is also in our collection. It's quite a small, and this painting is uh, almost almost one meter long. Uh, so the approaches to depicting the same subjects uh, was very different in the Chinese art, but still the meaning behind that was um, very, very positive in this case. And uh, it, it stands for the, the source of longevity, the source of uh, elixirs of health and uh, everything positive. And for sure, when the gurus arrived, there are uh, bees that are still active. So the industrious bees, uh, the honey, uh, the joys, and the uh, uh, symbolism of uh, words containing elixir of uh, eternal life is so obvious here. And as the uh, fruits grow and uh, the, the fall approaches, uh, here we can compare the uh, mums, the chrysanthemums, and the also the chrysanthemums, but uh, painted uh, with quite a different approach. This is a uh, mid 20th century. Uh, and this picture is supposed to be uh, mid 19th century. Uh, so we'll, I'll go into more details here so uh, we can just enjoy the. Uh, mm, uh, meticulous brush uh, at it as at most here. And by the way, these uh, bluish uh, patterns here, bluish dots, they are sub supposed to be moth. Uh, the moth, uh, the moth uh, that grows on uh, um, slabs of stone, on trees. Uh, so um, it's also a very prominent trait of uh, birds and flowers paintings starting from the Song Dynasty from 10th to 13th century. Uh, so uh, if we go back to the, uh, this picture, so we, you can see the small quail, the, the small bird. Uh, well, it's in Chinese it's Anchun. So An uh, sounds uh, much like An Ping An, so peace. And Chun uh, is like Chun, uh, the spring. So it may be also um, understood like um, the happiness and peace, uh, happy and peaceful spring. Uh, 
the, the wish for happy and peaceful spring, but we are looking at the picture uh, depicting uh, the autumn. Uh, and here we have those chrysanthemums growing around that uh, slab of stone. The stone is uh, has lots of holes. Uh, uh, it's almost like transparent in some pieces. And up there, there is an insect. So we'll uh, look at the insect closely. And uh, we can, uh, from uh, the depictions of uh, chrysanthemums, we can boldly state that this is fall, this is autumn. Uh, and this bird is quite big already and well active. It's not a, a kind of a small bird, it's an active bird. But this insect is uh, not a gra uh, an adult grasshopper. It's a very young uh, grasshopper in a nymph form. Uh, so I got this consultation. I, I, I'm not proficient in that, but I am. Um, uh, when I, I sh uh, shown uh, this uh, picture to uh, my friend, the, uh, the entomologist, um, he right away his like his words were this is a nymph form this is a young creature uh, underdeveloped um, undeveloped until they mature uh, insect uh, so uh, as we can see that uh, there is sorry um, so the, the big uh, bird but quite well quite, quite a big and active bird not not, not a young bird uh, and a young insect uh, up there so they are like antagonists so uh, the bird can just pluck can just eat the insect and that will be it uh, but the insect can escape actually in the holes in the uh, in the stone um, and uh, like and there's also a hint that uh, this uh, young, immature insect cannot survive the frost. But well, perhaps if the insect hides inside the stone, it will be okay for, for it to withstand uh, the harsh weather winter. And uh, like uh, uh, wake up uh, to, the, to the next spring. So there is some uh, like tension uh, in this uh, picture, but still there is some hope that the uh, a creature can escape from the other, like the big predator that the, this uh, quail is. And uh, after the uh, all, all the actually uh, uh, all, all the blooms, uh, all the flowers are wilted, uh, and this uh, the winter comes. Still, there is something to depict. Uh, the white herons or egrets and the um, kingfisher. The kingfisher here stands for the feminine beauty. And uh, the very um, color of the kingfisher feathers, uh, uh, I had to add it, uh, it stands for the femininity. Uh, the, the feathers of um, kingfisher uh, were used to adorn the uh, women's, uh, the female hairdresses. And here, uh, the uh, egrets or herons, uh, they are symbols of, they, they, there is lots of symbolism behind uh, herons. The herons were prized in poetry and um, Dofu described uh, herons like uh, the snowy guest, the guest from snow, the, their white feathers were so uh, standing out uh, and uh, it was also considered to be a, a good omen, the arrival of uh, herons. Uh, but also uh, uh, this uh, uh, so this loo, uh, it looks uh, and looks actually, because the upper part is like Malu, the loo, uh, the road, the street, and uh, the, the sound of the word. Um, it, uh, uh, it is, uh, could, could be compared to the, uh, to the word for road. So uh, depiction of um, 
uh, herons among lotuses uh, was uh, a symbol of uh, a good travel, uh, a lucky, uh, being lucky on the road uh, and some uh, smooth transi transition, transitioning because uh, Huelian, uh, uh, I had to mention that before, that in depiction of uh, lotuses, um, uh, there were also uh, that hint to learn uh, the continuity, uh, the smoothness, uh, like the uh, lotuses grow uh, around all the pond, like they, uh, they have those underwater roots they spread everywhere. And so the lotus was considered uh, also a symbol of continuity, of uh, smoothness. And lotuses and aigrets, although we don't see any lotuses here anymore, but these uh, aigrets or herons, they could be the symbol of good road. And also, uh, if we look at the character S, S um, uh, it sounds uh, familiar to, uh, it sounds, um, sorry, not familiar, it sounds similar to uh, that S uh, in Sukhau, uh, to consider, to ponder. Uh, so uh, there are nine aggregates here, and there was a saying by, Conf by Confucius that uh, a noble man should consider everything from nine points of view. Uh, so depicting nine aggregates uh, also may stand for like uh, nine points of view, uh, like uh, the warning for a virtuous person uh, not to go, not to not to jump into conclusions, not to be uh, rushy, but to uh, be moderate and evaluate everything from nine points of view. And well, so the winter came. We expect for the new season with more blo blossoms and like. Uh, but while uh, the nature suggests lots of uh, things to, to contemplate, to enjoy, to discover, still the humankind is uh, on a quest for some fantastic things, uh, extraordinary, uh, the things that no one has ever seen, but they, we are pretty sure that these things exist. Uh, so for this reason, the Chinese have invented this design, this ornament, uh, and it has some traits of a lotus. And it has some traits, sometimes it even has some uh, animal claws or some uh, source of um, bird hairs uh, and like. And it is said that this is a sacred flower, Bao Xianghua, uh, that grows somewhere in India, in Central Asia, in those faraway countries that people rarely go to. So uh, the Bao Xianghua became a very popular uh, decorative motif uh, for either Buddhist uh, canopies and uh, like embroideries in temples, uh, to some ordinary daily things like this uh, tea caddy, the uh, jar for keeping tea leaves in it. And the uh, elites who depicted flowers just for, for its son's sake, uh, for contemplation, the Buddhists uh, who adorned their altars with flowers, uh, those uh, elites and those spiritual leaders, uh, they also influenced the folk beliefs and folk art. Uh, so here we see the uh, woodblock prints in our collection uh, that show the same uh, beaches that stand for longevity. Also, there are pomegranates that stand for multiple descendants. Uh, strange flowers that could be recognized as uh, like perhaps uh, peonies, uh, dotted uh, persimmon uh, uh, fruits. So there are lots of other, uh, lots of different uh, uh, flowers of different seasons combined in these vases as the uh, wish for a good new year. And these, you, you can see the plum blossom here combined with uh, mums uh, of autumn. 
uh, and of orchids protruding here from the vase falling like that. And here even the lingy uh, mushrooms depicted in quite a strange way, but this is a, it's actually a mushroom considered to be also a fruit and a well-wishing fruit. And this motive in Chinese art, it is often seen as a citron. Uh, it is called also, also called the Buddha's hand. And it's like the closest relative of uh, lemons, oranges and like. And it is used for medicine and used for uh, fragrances uh, for home. Uh, and we, if we uh, still have some time, uh, I'd like to point out like mm, some uh, uh, some uh, flowers uh, in the Chinese lore in the Chinese uh, history of us. Uh, were not considered as much uh, beautiful, prized as it was. Uh, those uh, flowers were in Europe. Uh, the Chinese uh, were quite anxious about cactuses. We have no depictions of cactuses here, but still, it, I have to mention that, that until recently they didn't understand what's the beauty of such a prickly thing. Uh, it can harm you. It's not beautiful at all. I'd like. So the roses that they grow, they were uh, they try to avoid all thorns, and uh, the roses were not uh, popular in the uh, Chinese painting at all. Uh, but this painting belongs to uh, a famous um, philanthropist, businessman, and a Buddhist, Wang Zhang or Wang Yiting, uh, who was uh, an active uh, uh, like peacemaker. Uh, during the harsh times of uh, uh, like the first years of Rep Chinese Republic, then uh, he died in, uh, in uh, already uh, under the Japanese occupation. Uh, but he was uh, a philanthropist and a person with like really good soft skills uh, who could use not only his wealth, but his uh, uh, charm to uh, influence people to try to make treaties to try to try to harmonize relationships uh, among the westerners among the chinese uh, he lived in shanghai he lived uh, for, for some time he lived in japan uh, and he uh, painted this these roses uh, as a kind of a, a, a like a reference to the European con uh, culture, to the European uh, understanding of roses as beautiful. And here uh, writes the name of uh, Monsieur Jaspar, Yashibo Sienshu, Mr. Jaspar, Ya, the same character, Ya, the exuberance, the sophistication, uh, Ya Do, so many sophistications. So it's like he's depicting his. Uh, uh, talking about Monsieur Jaspar as a very sophisticated person uh, in a positive way. And he also wishes him to get more of these rare, sophisticated, exuberant things. Uh, another present, uh, for this, this was for Madame Jaspar, and uh, uh, it, it is written uh, so on the back of this painting. It's a small album painting by the famous Chen Shu uh, one of the famous. Uh, Southern school uh, painters of the early 20th century. And uh, you can see that birds and flowers painting, in fact, it, uh, it, it has, it, it focuses not only on feathers and petals, but also on crusty crabs, on small insects, uh, and all uh, forms of animals. Um, are also the subject of, in fact, the birds and flower gen. And uh, as we can, like, can compare the uh, thing from uh, like uh, almost uh, uh, already 90 years back. And here is like the, the painting that was created quite recently and uh, exhibited um, in our temporary exhibition back in Kiev uh, this, uh, this fall and um, 
this winter, actually. Uh, so uh, the modern artists, they draw inspiration from the same subject. And uh, here's the work of Chi Shao Tin, uh, who, had, uh, who had given that master class recently. Uh, those, uh, these are her approach to lotuses, lotus leaves and fishes. Uh, um, and lotus flowers, as you can see. Um, she works in the CAE uh, manner, uh, in a freehand manner of Chinese painting, while uh, her colleague, uh, Xinya Wang, is uh, painting uh, in a very different pace, uh, in a very different technique. Uh, I've been talking already that this is called uh, Gung Bi, the meticulous brush. And uh, this needs uh, lots of like about 20 layers of paint on a silk. And here she also imitates the crack on the cracks on the old silk. Uh, she paints these uh, false uh, tremploy uh, cracks uh, by, by her brush. And the subject of her painting is uh, magnolia, magnolia, uh, which is U line. Um, Literally, this uh, this is a jade orchid, and it also has lots of positive meanings. And it's a wish for a good career as well, because uh, jade uh, mentions jade uh, rooms where the name for the uh, uh, holes for the high officials. And eventually, the quotes about the uh, cypress and uh, pine tree withstanding the hardships of uh, uh, winter and the, the, this way sh showing their true values uh, is the quote that is uh, carved uh, on a, a seal print actually. And uh, this, uh, this um, print seal was uh, exhibited uh, in our museum this uh, winter. Uh, so, uh, uh, at this point, uh, I just um, uh, add that uh, perhaps I've skipped some ideas. Uh, there, there's still so much to elaborate on every, um, uh, like, uh, every um, plant or animal uh, to look at the um, uh, uh, the creations and talk about the creators. And um, perhaps, um, you know, <laughs> I, I should uh, like perhaps uh, present more next time to give an even a better picture, but still for now, uh, it is so, so uh, please uh, ask your questions. And uh, I, I'd like to thank, uh, Confucius Institute once again for giving me such an opportunity to talk about my favorite subject and to uh, share my joy of looking at the Chinese art with you. Thank you, Mo.